Hello, hi, this is Father Dariusz Iwański once again. Uh, this is the second of the conferences that I'm supposed to deliver during this uh, Lenten retreat. As I promised uh, yesterday, uh, when we were talking about faith and how it starts on a certain level, on the level of your heart, we also have to take into consideration that your faith is not a stable thing. It will undergo certain challenges. I mean, it will face challenges, undergo certain crises. And what do you do when you face a crisis? Well, there are things you have to be aware of. Some people get scandalized. They believe crisis is something that they would never face. Or when they finally face it, they think it's so shameful that they shouldn't be really talking to it about it to anybody. Well, the thing is, you should talk about it, and you should talk about it to God. You should complain to God, as Job did. Before I tell you about Job, the main protagonist of the book of Job, my favorite from the Old Testament, I have to share with you something, I want to share with you something that I really lived when I was working in the U.S. time ago as a parish priest. Well, you know, this one year, one of my students, I was responsible for the First Communion program in the parish, so I would be teaching kids, you know, how to, you know, everything that is necessary for the kids to memorize before they get their First Communion. One of my students, uh, little Richard, Rick, uh, once uh, came knock on the door of the rectory, the place where the priests live, and he and his uh, father asked me to go and see their mother in the hospital. I was not aware of the problem. It re I realized that the mother of the poor Richard, the, that nine-year-old kid, she was diagnosed with a terrible cancer. She was, at the time, 35 or so, and she was dying of cancer. I went there to the hospital with him to bring communion and to anoint her, bring the sacrament of the sick. And I was devastated by the sight, you know, seeing her, a young woman, looking like she was 60 or 70, meaning devastated by the disease that was going on in her. I couldn't, I just couldn't help it. I started crying. But then, two weeks later, the same Richard and his, his father asked me to, actually it was the father to ask me to do a thing that I had never done before. As I realized, the mother was supposed to be unplugged. I had, they had to pull the plug on her, meaning the machinery that was keeping her alive. She was in such a bad shape that the machinery that was keeping her alive was supposed to be unplugged, meaning they were about to let her go, meaning let her die. She was in such a bad shape. Well, the father asked me to join them uh, at the very last meeting with her before they say goodbye, which I did. I went there to the hospital and I accompanied the family, the poor father and his two boys, Richard and his younger brother, when I entered the room, I couldn't believe it. The woman was on her bed. Uh, the father, the, her husband, a big man, I think he was a, a two meter tall man, um, he had a hard time um, talking to his kids, to his boys, sons. He was to deliver a, a terrible message. He was to deliver the message of the kind, well, you know, boys, this is the very last time you see your mama. Are you ready for that? Well, and the boys were like in denial. They sort of understood that something wrong is going on. Their mother unconscious laying in, in her bed. The, the boys were aware of something wrong, terrible going on, but at the same time, in order to sort of charm up the reality 
they were playing with wires, you know, there was, a pl there was plenty of equipment, so they were playing with the stuff. And so the father had a hard, hard time uh, letting them, I mean, having them listen to what he wanted to say. So I knelt down in front of my uh, student, Richard, and I said, Richard, wait a second. Your dad is willing to tell you something very important. Would you have a minute to listen to him? Which he did. And I couldn't believe it for the first time. Uh, even when I recall the, the whole thing, I still have tears in my, in my eyes. When he, the father, the big man, when he knelt in front of his sons and told them, boys, Richard, do you understand that this is the very last time you are seeing your mama? Richard, the young one, he said, yeah, sure I do. Well, so now go and kiss your mama goodbye, which he did. He jumped on the bed and kissed her goodbye, saying, goodbye, mama, and went back to playing with the wires. I couldn't believe it. It was so devastating. Well, the session was over 10 minutes later. We had to leave the room, and I was told two hours later they really pulled the plug on her. The woman died that very night. And so there you go. There you have a father with his two sons. And you have him lose his wife. And what do you do? The funeral just gathered plenty of people, their friends, family members, whoever. The church was packed. But I heard over and over again, that question that people were asking, wait a second, where was God? Where was God that he let her die? Couldn't she just live, continue living, and just seeing her sons growing up? Couldn't she just live and, you know, be a good spouse to her husband, like many, like in many couples they are? Why did he have to take her right now? And you see, there are moments in life, there are things in life there are no good answers to, but people struggle to come up with some answers to big time problems. And this is actually the issue when you, when you go to read the book of Job, this is one of the issues that the book deals with. So there you have Job, the perfect protagonist, the incarnation of all those values and virtues that the wise men of Israel were professing. There you have a handbook example of what it means to be a wise man. There you have, in the first two chapters, you hear, actually in the first one, you hear and read how perfectly awarded and rewarded was Job for his being perfect, pious, uh, um, uh, uh, righteous and avoiding any kind of evil. He was the most respected person in that world, according to what the author says. But even God, you have access to what God thinks about Job. God, in the first two chapters, twice repeats that very assessment, saying to Satan, well, did you see my servant Job? He is the most perfect, the most righteous, the most venerated man in, the, in the, the whole East. He is a servant of mine. Well, the Satan started questioning uh, that very judgment that God passed on his servant and said, well, you know what? It's all interested. I mean, Job is interested in being rewarded. That's why he worships you. God says, you go ahead and you check it out for yourself. And so Job is going to be put to test, to two horrible tests. Because one day he loses all his children and all his possessions. Then a couple of days later, he is being struck by another um, horrible test. 
well, he loses his, uh, his health. He's being touched by a terrible disease, and it's more than sure that he is dying, like he was diagnosed with cancer or something. And Job, regardless of this, the whole situation, is still keeping his faith and is still looking up to God to the point that even his wife is screaming and kicking and telling him, you curse God and die. It was probably what she meant by euthanasia. Well, if you curse God, God would never let you do that. You curse God, God kills you that very moment. That was the, her conviction. Job says, I'm not going to do that. His friends came to assist him and accompany him uh, during those horrible days. They thought that they would come and sit with him and they would cheer him up. They would comfort, bring him comfort just saying things. Well, when they came over and they saw Job, they couldn't help it. They couldn't say a word. They just sat down next to him for seven days and seven nights, remained in that posture. So, mm, pretty soon after, the, after that week, Job, out of pain, started screaming and kicking, and that is very unusual for the patient Job we dealt with before. And Job is kind of giving God a hard time about the whole thing that happened to him. And once the friends heard that, and they happened to be sages of Israel as well, once they heard that terrible talk delivered by Job, terrible to their ears, they felt entitled or sort of called up to correct Job on what he was saying. The first assumption is that nothing happens without being caused by something else. So if you suffer, it is a consequence of something that you have done before. You must have done something that God considered inappropriate, and in return, he punished you with suffering. That, that, is, that is their very first assumption. Well, in the book of uh, Job, but in the whole wisdom literature, biblical wisdom literature, it is quite natural that the sages of Israel take that assumption as one of the principles of their worldview. Every, every act has consequences. If you look at consequences, you can deduce uh, what act has been committed. If you did something good, you got rewarded with a good thing. If you did something wrong, God punished you with something bad, suffering, l um, losing your children in the case of Job, a loss or something. And if you don't recognize it, that chain of um, act and consequence, you must be a silly, stupid man. So they try to talk him uh, to talk him over, uh, to accept that very act, uh, consequence, a chain. Job says, I don't find anything that horrible I'm, I could have committed that would justify the suffering that I was, that came upon my head. And the friends are trying harder and harder to get him out of that vicious circle, sort of, and try to talk him into confessing his sin. Uh, that way, defending God's honor. They think that by defending God's reputation, his honor, and condemning jo Job, they do the right thing. Well, Job is at odds with his friends, and he is in a very, in a verbal battle with them, telling them that they are bringing more suffering to him by his, by, by their talks. He says, 
you align with me and you help me out by helping me understand, not condemning me. Don't say a word if you don't have anything to, uh, to say but condemn me. Don't say anything. If you don't want to help me in my confrontation with God, then stop talking. They couldn't help it. They kept talking. Finally, Eliphaz, the, the oldest of the friends or the most honorable among them, he comes up with a list of sins that Job must have committed. Otherwise, God wouldn't have punished him that badly. That is a terrible thing. How can you judge a person on what she is go or he is going through um, by or deducing possible sins that she or he may have committed? That is a terrible thing. So Job and his friends, at one point, they, they take two separate ways. And Job is preparing, getting ready for his confrontation with God. And he is giving God a hard time. He is giving him a hard time saying, well, you know what? I don't care what you do, who you are. I know that you had no right to punish me so badly. In a way, he's buying that logic of his friends by saying, well, it is a punishment, but God was wrong. I did not deserve that punishment. So he says, I will prove God wrong. Just give me a chance so that may, I may throw it in your face that you made a mistake, and by, and by mistake, you punished me with this horrible suffering. You had no right to do it. So when the friends proved useless, he wanted to prove God wrong. That was Job's kind of proceeding. And so finally, God is showing up. Finally, he lets him talk. He lets himself talk, and he lets Job talk as well. And he says, you know what? You were asking questions. Why suffering? Why did you have to go through that? And he didn't, and God never responded to those questions because there are no good answers. But he never took it, took it against Job that he was so harsh in his approach to God, in his talking to God. Actually, he praised him for that. In the very last chapter of the book of Job, it is the friends, those pious ones, those devout ones, those wise men, they are punished by God who says, you are not talking the truth about me. I'm not a machine to punish people for things. I'm not a machine. I'm not a machine that, you know, if you do something wrong, I must immediately punish you for that. <laughs> it's not who God is. So you were transmitting a very horrible message about me to the ears of God and to the ears of the, of the readers of the book as well. So he says, you go to Job, who is the righteous, and gets rehab rehabilitated. You go to Job and you acknowledge him as the righteous person because he did not do anything wrong. And I, I really uh, recognize his right to speak whatever his sorrowful soul is having him do, having him speak. His suffering gave him the right to speak the harsh words, even to God. Anytime I read that, I think of all sorts of sufferings I myself had to go through. Like last year, I lost my mother to uh, COVID-19. She got diagnosed with that disease, and three weeks later, she was dead. My dad died two, week, two years ago, and it is a horrible thing to lose your parents, undeniable. At the same time, you constantly face challenges and sufferings, and what do you do with them? You get people who tell you, you know what, it's your own fault. You get other people to tell you, 
nothing, but they prefer to stay with you, to align with you without saying a word because they don't find right words. And these are the best friends. What do you do if your faith is mm, affected by suffering? You may get angry with God because you yourself got to suffer or somebody from your family, from among your friends, had to go through a horrible suffering and you may be angry with God, with God and you have all the right in the world to, to be like that. And God does not deny you that uh, right. He is saying you can talk whatever your mind tells you. You are talking to a friend. You may ask questions that you will never get a right answer to, but by asking them, you are still online with me. You are in touch with me. So this is the very thing. You may do, of course, and other things, like you may say, so if God is so horrible, I quit. I quit on my faith, I quit on God, and I'm just trying to live my life separated from God. I don't like him. He is not really uh, working up to my favor. Well, you may do that. At the same time, cutting, cutting yourself off from all that source of life and blessing, you may do that. There are no good solutions to suffering, no good explanations. If anybody comes to you and says, well, you know, you suffer or somebody from your family suffers because Adam and Eve, you know, they sinned. Well, he tells you the truth. Theologically, it is true. Uh, sin and suffering came through this world through the first original sin of the first parents, Adam and Eve. It's true. Theologically, it's, it's true. Would that bring any comfort to the person who suffers? Not at all. So what do you do? You stop talking. You shut up. You try to offer your time to the person you want to bring comfort to. You try to let or get that person talk, even if he or she has to say harsh things to God and about God. Do not get scandalized. Just let them do it. This is authorized by God himself. Do not let that in the way with your faith. As long as you talk to God, even telling him harsh things, you are on the right path. Do not let yourself to be deluded by you know, certain people, certain people who give you advice by saying, well, you know what, you did that or that, or you go through that because something. Don't listen to them. They are not bringing comfort. You will know a good friend when you see him on your side in the most sorrowful moments of your, lives, of your life without saying a word, but simply aligning with you. And you can do the same to your friends. You can bring comfort by being with them, not by avoiding them. You can bring comfort not by bringing about solutions, even theologically correct solutions, forget it. You can offer up, you can offer your time. And this is what brings most of the comfort necessary. Thank you very much for giving me that opportunity to share with you about my favorite book and also about that very factor of suffering that is is included in our lives, no matter how faithful, how what uh, kind of faith we have, how mm, devout we are. We all go through sufferings, different kinds, and we all have to know how the things are when we deal with those and God. Amen.